Are you taking the AP Environmental Science exam? If so, you're in the right place. In this video, I'm gonna be joined by Jordan Smeeds from Apes versus Everybody, one of the best accounts on Instagram and YouTube that you're gonna find. I wanna welcome you to our session. If you are here live, talk to us in the chat. Let us know what you're covering in your AP Environmental Science um, class right now. If you are joining us in the comments, afterwards, you're watching the recording, post those questions in the comments. Jordan and I are gonna come in and answer them. I wanna welcome Jordan now. I'm gonna switch over. Jordan, how are you doing today? I'm doing well, John. Thanks for the introduction there. Uh, I think you're too kind and one of the best accounts, but you know, I'll take the compliment if I can get it. Uh, AP Bio Penguins, big fan of, of hers. So very neat to see she's working with you as well. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm just really excited to be part of this teacher community of folks creating things online, sharing them with students and having Marco Learning coordinate this and put us in touch. So it's awesome to be here. And Jordan, I, as we go through the session, I'm going to be posting the link to your YouTube channel. What is on your YouTube channel that's valuable if I'm an AP Environmental Science student? Great question. Um, it, so, trying to be humble still, uh, I would say everything, <laughs> frankly. Um, I've worked really hard, you guys, to put a 8 to 12 minute video that covers every single topic in the CED. So the CED is are the binders you can see behind John there. Uh, it is the course and exam description. It's everything you need to know. And in APES, there are nine units, 99 topics. And there is a video currently for about 95 of them. The last few are trickling in. So um, in short, you could cover the entire course, take notes on those videos, and hopefully cover the basics. There are some skills that we're going to talk about. There are some hacks. You have to be a good writer. Um, but there are some tools that we can learn in today's review and in the other reviews that are coming up um, every Wednesday in March that will help you become a better writer to pair with that content that's all throughout that YouTube channel. So really appreciate if you guys go check that out. Like I said, uh, I've spent a lot of time and really tried to cover the basis for you guys. I really wanna make it simple, make it clear uh, what you need to know. And that's what the course and exam description does for teachers. It's made it so clear to us, for instance, in unit 4.5, what do we have to cover about wind? It's not just guesswork anymore, it's very clear. And so if you watch the videos, each video starts at the very beginning with the learning objectives you need. And then we walk through them, uh, sometimes in eight, sometimes uh, to my students' uh, chagrin, 16 minutes. But I do my best to really cram it full of uh, the info you need, guys. So check that out. And um, yeah, it's, it's really got what you need to do well on this exam. Wonderful. So in today's live review, let's talk about what we're going to cover. We're going to talk a little bit about the 2021 AP exams. We're going to talk about some writing hacks you can use for these free response questions. I've done this with you before on this channel. There's some particular skills that, that Jordan's going to be going over with all of you. And then we're also going to be focusing a little bit on unit three. What is unit three in the AP Environmental Science curriculum? Yeah, unit three is populations. And what I love about APES is it covers animal populations, bacterial populations, plant populations, and human populations. So about half the unit focuses on human populations. Today, we're focusing more on biodiversity and how population dynamics impact biodiversity, because that is, for lack of a better term, that's an apes hack, kind of. If you can relate populations and biodiversity, uh, you have a really good chance of writing successful FRQ answers. You don't want to kind of get stuck in the weeds of what's going to happen to just one species or one organism, or it's going to be bad for you know, organisms, we want to think about biodiversity. How do whole populations change, ebb and flow? What does that do to biodiversity in a community, in an ecosystem? And those are big picture ideas that we have to have down on this exam. Well, I'm terrified. I'm not ready for the exam. So let's get right into it. Jordan, I'm going to go ahead and let you uh, share your screen. Sure thing. We can start with this exam format. Um, and I'll turn it over to you and I'll be in and out guys. I'm going to be here, here in the chat, providing some links to some of the resources. And, um, I encourage you to post all your questions again, whether you're watching this live or watching it afterwards. Um, and, uh, if you like this video, go ahead and press that like button and subscribe to our channel. Yeah, absolutely. Make sure to check out Marco learning on all the socials. Uh, we have started doing a lot of collaborations and it's just been so fun to reach a wider audience to have events like this with you guys. So check them out. Uh, I don't have a TikTok. John has told me that it is the place to be. My students have confirmed this. So it's coming. It's the place to be. It really is. Bro. That's what they're going to call you on TikTok. Bro or bro. Yeah. And that's where you got to be, bro. 
All right, I'm going to work on being Bruh and Mr. Smeads, uh, different different names in different places. So there we go. TikTok's coming soon. John is in my ear and, and I'm going to listen. So Apes versus Everybody is Instagram. What I think is really neat is at the end of today's video, I'm going to talk ex uh, specifically about how you can actually use Instagram to study. So instead of just looking at the post and being like, oh, nice, I take apes. I better like that post. We're going to go through how could you actually use the post to study. So that is really the goal of posting every day. So I'll talk about that towards the end of the video and we'll, you know, look through that uh, specifically, talk about how you can use it. So again, as John mentioned, we're going to cover writing hacks. We're going to go through population review and go to FRQ answers. And then we're going to talk about specifically, how do you study for apes? Uh, and what are some resources you can use? So I want you to leave this video with a plan and resources where you can find what you need and how you can use it to get ready for this exam. So let's get into it here. Uh, first and foremost, APES exam update. This information was released by the college board not too long ago. Uh, and so the first administration window is the normal exam date. That was May 14 at noon. The format is a traditional paper exam. Location is in school only. So this is ultimately up to your school's AP coordinator. So you're going to have to reach out to them and see what your testing options are. Um, for my school, personally, we are selecting option number two. So we're going to be taking a digital exam. That's Thursday, May 27th at 4 p.m. We are going to be taking it in school to kind of provide stable Wi-Fi, make sure that if you guys have questions or concerns that we're there to help feed those, uh, field those questions, and just make sure that you're in a stable, consistent environment for that test. It's going to be the same exact format, but the one drawback is that there's no moving between questions when finished. John had an awesome live stream last night. I encourage you to go check that out on Marco Learning's YouTube. Exactly uh, pulling back the curtain, so to speak, on what do these questions look like? What does it mean to not be able to move between questions? They have some screenshots. In April, there will actually be an interactive simulation where we can go through and see what does it look like to take this? What does it feel like to take a digital exam where you're not toggling between questions, where you are simply moving on from question to question. So the good news is we can feel really comfortable with this by the time that we take this exam. Uh, and so, like I said, my students and I selected for May 27th, a little extra time to review, and then there is a June 11th date. Finally though, before we move on, I encourage you to reach out to your AP coordinator. You really have to see what they're thinking because this is falling to a school by school decision. So what is the format? Whether or not you take it on paper, whether or not you take it on a computer, the format is the same. <clears throat> you have 80 multiple choice questions. There are going to be four answer options, which is a change from five in years past. So four answer options, 90 minutes, and that's going to be weighted as 60% of the exam. So you have to know your stuff to do well on the APES exam. You're not going to do well on that multiple choice without the solid content you need. Again, one more time, go check out the YouTube channel. That's uh, my name, Jordan Dishinger Smeads. It'll be linked in here a lot, though that covers all of the content that you need. So that's 60% right there. Now the FRQs cover content, but they're a little bit more skills-based. 40% of the exam waiting is going to be from three FRQs that you have 70 minutes to write. We know that one of those will be designing an investigation. So you will actually have to propose either variables or a testing hypothesis. Uh, so it'll be experiment-based. We know that one of them will be analyzing an environmental problem and then doing calculations. We know that one of them will be analyzing an environmental problem and then proposing solutions. So it's really important when you are learning content this year in APES, always be asking yourself, what's the solution to this problem? So don't just know that SOX and NOx are precursors to acid rain. Be able to think about how could we reduce acid rain in the future? Or how could we treat soil or water that has been impacted by acid rain? And then one big change from the 2020 exam the 2021 exams are not open note. So it's not open note. It's not open book uh, as it was last year. And so you do have to actually take this from memory. This is not something where, again, you are flipping your book open and flipping your, your notes open. So especially if you're in a school, that's obviously going to be a proctored environment. And so that is a big change from 2020. So that makes studying and prepping and having this content down pat even more important. So that's a lot of information, a lot of things you need. Let's talk about skills though. Let's talk about how you can maximize your writing scores on this 
exam. Okay, that's 40% of the exam and it's the part of the exam that you have the most control of. And so on uh, the Apes versus Everybody account on my YouTube channel, I sign off a lot of my videos with think like a mountain and write like a scholar. So you have to think like a mountain, that kind of means thinking big picture, thinking about the effects on the environment of human actions. But writing like a scholar is huge. It's 40% of the exam and it's a skill that's really transferable to college. So this FRQ task verb sheet, you can find in the community section of my YouTube page. It'll be something we share out later uh, in this post as well. But it's a really helpful resource to remind you, what does it mean when I have to describe on an FRQ? What does it mean when I have to explain an FRQ? And so in my class with my students, in fact, even just today, we're going through sample student answers. And what I want you to do is move away from that, this sounds smart, or this sounds like the student really knows what they're talking about, and more towards, did they use two sentences, basic key details to describe? When you're explaining something, did you give cause and effect link the two ideas together? And so again, just a super helpful resource that I encourage you to go find on the community page of my YouTube channel and use it when you write FRQs for your class as you prepare for the exam. Now let's talk about the hacks, okay? And so this is, again, what I like to call working smarter rather than working harder. So on each of these FRQs, there will be 10 points. Now, the first step before you dive into it, before you roll up your sleeves and kind of just attack this FRQ, the first step is to read through the entire thing once. Now, why are we gonna do this? Well, there are 10 points, but not all 10 points are created equal. And what that means is some of the points are much easier to earn than others. So look for the three to four identify or the make a claim points. So follow me back here to the write like a scholar handout. Identify one sentence max, simple answer, no elaboration. You're simply saying what is an environmental effect of you know, X, Y, or Z. Um, you're simply saying here is a solution to reduce air pollution, um, an air pollutant like socks or NOx. And so it's simple, it's right to the point. It won't take you long. And if you know it, you're gonna earn the point very easily. Same thing with make a claim, make a claim. One or two sentences, more, more like one most of the times, just base your claim on your FRQ knowledge or evidence that they give you in a graph or a figure. And so you wanna earn these easy points first. A couple of reasons for this. You wanna earn them first because they build your confidence. When you're taking an exam, nobody likes to feel like they bombed the first three points and then have 27 more points to answer. We wanna get some points in our pocket. We wanna think of it as I'm building myself up towards the score I want, not, oh boy, I'm four answers in and I don't know if I earned any points yet. So they're easy points to earn compared to all the other points, but you still need to take your time. So here's what I encourage you to do. Double check, identify, and make a claim answers, especially if you have to use data. Be very cautious because the figures and the graphs that are used on APES exams are especially confusing. Many times they have double axis labels or they will have three or four graphs all uh, thrown together and you have to pick the one that actually has the data you need. Oftentimes you're going to have five or six different categories of data graphed, or sometimes even you'll have a stacked uh, bar graph. And so you may have to interpret that and watch for these kind of tricky labels that they put in, honestly, on purpose. They want to see the college board cares about you being a good reader of data and a good interpreter of graphs. So it's really important to take your time. I tell my students to almost assume that they could have made a mistake the first time and to double check their answer before moving on. Again, super, super important that we get this three to four point base out of our 10 points total. So we need to make sure that the easy points we are earning for sure because they're within everyone's reach. They're what I call low hanging fruit. Everyone can read a graph and find the figure. Everyone for the most part is gonna be able to identify one secondary air pollutant or identify the year in a graph that you know, a, a pollutant surpassed a certain level. So you have to earn those three to four points that is kind of like your floor. Like that's the lowest you could do even if you had a really bad FRQ. So that's super critical. Then what you wanna do is move on in a way that's targeted. And so what that means is going on to the describes and the explains and the proposed solution questions in a targeted order. So you don't just start flying through them, but you pick the ones you're most confident on first. And so I really want you to get in the habit of writing the 
answers that you feel the least confident on last. Spend the lowest amount of time on them and spend more time on what you're most confident on. I like to call this quality over quantity. Uh, so attempt fewer points, but earn more of the points you attempt. And if you're wondering how many points do I need to earn, I have an asterisk next to target FRQ averages for the exam here because these are not official cut scores. Cut score means what do you actually have to earn to get a three, four, or five. Those are not released yet. We haven't had the 2021 exam yet, so we don't know what those are. And so be careful here. Um, knock on wood, I'm not promising this, but historically, if you can average a five or six out of 10, you've put yourself in good position for a three. If you can average a six to seven out of 10, you put yourself in great position for a four. If you want a five, typically when I look at my own student data and we look at national data, you wanna be averaging around a seven to eight to be sure to get a five in the exam. Um, and so what that means is depending on your target score, you can afford to miss two to four points per FRQ. And writing an FRQ that you are totally unsure about and spending three or four minutes on it and being like, oh boy, I really took a swing on that one. It might not be a good use of your time when you consider that you could have earned an identify if you had really carefully read through it and ensured that you got that point. So think of FRQs as building that three to four point base. What are the easy points that are within reach as long as you take your time? And then what are the next couple points that are more challenging, but that you're going to take your time, sink into, and try to earn? Again, as a rule of thumb on those describes and explains, we want two sentences for describe. And you don't need three full sentences for explain, but think of it as three key components to your answer. And so that is what I want you to do. Get that three to four point base, move on to the describes and explains, and then know what your target score is. If your target score is a four on the exam, you want a six to seven on the FRQ. And so if there's two questions that are super hard, don't sink eight minutes into those two questions when you only have 23-ish minutes per FRQ. That's too much time to spend on something you're not confident on. So quality over quantity. Before we actually move on and look at an FRQ and try this, really quickly, I want to tell a story of one of my students from last year. All year, she had been on the verge of scoring a three on our mock exams in class, on our unit exams. And so I felt confident she could earn a three, but I was a little bit nervous because a lot of times she was just below that five to six point average. Uh, and I knew she could do it, but I wasn't sure if she'd be able to pull it off. Coronavirus hit, the school was closed down. Um, she kept studying, she kept watching the videos, she kept writing practice FRQs. And in the exam on May, uh, she got a four. And when I saw her answers and I looked through what she wrote, it was clear that she didn't answer a handful of points on each of the two FRQs, but the points she attempted, she earned. And so she took her time, she forgot about the few points that were really, really hard, focused on the ones she knew she could earn, and I was just so happy to see her earn that score because she really, really worked to show what she knows, show what she knew, you know, and didn't worry about all of these other points that she wasn't positive about. So she did that. And it was just so neat to see her put this strategy into action. So it really can be done. You don't have to get a 10 out of 10 by any means. Um, you're shooting for a six to seven if you want a four. And so knowing that can help you free up some time. So let's actually look at this and see what this looks like here. Um, so what we have is an exam from 2019. And what I want to do is actually walk through with you uh, how I would attack this exam. So what we have here is the National Park Visibility Changes. Um, and we have four different parks, Sequoia, Big Bend, Great Smoky Mountains, and Yellowstone. And then we want to orient ourselves with the key. We have historical visibility in you know, the stripe lines here. And then shaded in is the 2015 average visibility. Notice that we have visibility miles and national parks. This is a pretty easy graph. Um, some of them will be harder than this, but this is what they're showing you here. And so right off the bat, identify the national park that has the greatest loss of visibility as of 2015 when compared to the historical average. So we wanna take our time, double check that we've got this right. We're looking for the biggest difference in historical versus 2015. And we might glance at this and go, okay, Sequoia, but we want to really take our time and double check back through, make sure that there's not a greater change than we see here. And so then we know, you know, there's our identify point, and then we want to move on. Now, what I'm going to do is definitely answer this point and this point right off the bat. There, I've answered all my identifies. Now I'm going to look, and I'm not just going to start here. I'm not going to go describe how a primary air pollutant becomes 
part of the atmosphere. Now that I've answered the three identifies, I'm gonna look at the describe. So here's a describe, here's a describe. And then I might look at the discuss and decide, okay, you know, excluding air pollution, discuss two additional ways national park ecosystems are degraded by high levels of visitor use. Then I might look at, you know, this, this point I have highlighted, describe how a secondary air pollutant is formed within the atmosphere, and then describe how a primary air pollutant becomes part of the atmosphere. I might skip down here if I think that, you know, the roads being built to maintain these high volumes of traffic is disrupting wildlife, or that people might be walking off the trail and destroying native plant habitats. I might think D is the easiest point. I'm going right there. Notice I didn't just go right in order because if I did, maybe I would have spent a ton of time trying to calculate percent change and gotten it wrong and never made it down here to this easy question that I know two answers for. So again, we would go through the identifies, answer these, then we're going down to letter D because that's what we feel the most confident on. Now we might skip back up to our describes and then we might save the discuss two specific actions for last because that might be really challenging and maybe the math is easier. So that's how I would actually walk through one of these FRQs in a targeted way. I want my identifies first, then I want my describes, but maybe I go down to a discuss if I'm more confident there. And that is how I'm gonna attack this so that I'm earning the most points possible. And I'm not just kind of swinging about uh, hoping that I get points, I'm working in a targeted way. So what we're gonna do here in a second is go through uh, some actual content review. So that was kind of segment one. That was uh, exam hacks, writing hacks. How do you want to attack the writing prompts in a way that maximizes your stamina and gets you the most points? So in a second here, we'll be going through some content from unit three that is important to understand. Great. And I wanted to ask you, Jordan, um, just as we uh, are going through this, so at this point in the year, it's March. Some people are going to be watching this recording later is the issue that people have that they are behind on content or is the issue that they haven't been practicing the strategies you just described, these exam hacks? That is a great question. I think that both pieces are necessary for you to do well. You're not gonna be able to write great questions if you don't have the content down. So the content is the foundation. You know, the content is kind of like, it gives you a shot. It gives you a shot to get a three, four or five. Um, so you need a base level of content, but the way that you ensure that you get that three or that you move up into the four or five range is really by doing good writing. And that's where the skills come in. So in my experience, teachers who are teaching a brick and mortar in the classroom course by and large are doing well on content pacing. They are covering the content. Some of them are, you know, quite a bit further ahead than I am actually. And you know, they're doing well, I think, in covering content. The teachers that are behind a little bit, I'm finding a lot of them are starting to use videos, um, starting to try to cover content more with the college boards, daily videos in AP Classroom. So I highly recommend using videos to especially make up ground if you are behind. My students and I are right about in the middle of unit seven, which is a decent place to be. That's a touch behind where I would be ideally, but our school starts in like the second week of September. Uh, you know, so that's about where we can be moving at a decent clip. But again, my advice to students would be cover content quickly with videos, get the basic content down, look for the big picture ideas, and then work on the skills though, because the skills are what really, you know, bring home that passing score. You can do a solid job on the multiple choice, but if the FRQs fall apart, which they can, if you're not solid, if you don't execute, that's what kills students. And that that's what earns students who know their stuff two sometimes because they just don't quite execute or it costs those students who are really putting in the effort who know they deserve a four or five it results in them getting a three uh, and so it's yeah. kind of the achilles heel is, is this frq writing so that's so interesting because there's a bit of a debate emerging in the comments here where some people are saying hey the um the timing isn't so bad for me other people are running at a time some people are are not writing complete sentences so really mm -hmm. getting your rhythm down yeah and, like executing on what you need to, to deliver to the yeah. readers and get out. That's part of what we're talking about with AP exam hacks as, as part of the series, yeah. right? It's not, you can memorize all the things and watch all the videos mm -hmm. and you mess up your timing and you don't really know how it scored very well. You can get yourself yeah. in trouble. 
Yeah, let me let me touch on that really quickly because my heart goes out to those students. Um, and, and I've had those students. Every teacher has those students, and I had a lot more of them early in my career because I was inexperienced and I wasn't, I didn't know how to prepare my students for FRQs as well my first few years. And so um, I feel your pain to the people in the chat. Uh, when your FRQs are coming up short and you really feel like you know your content, you score well on multiple choice, um, I feel your pain and I've kind of taken this on. And this is why I'm so passionate about FRQ writing. This is why I created the task verb sheet. This is why I tried to really distill the process down you know, to a very formulaic way of building your points up, working to that three to four point basement. What I mean by that is it's kind of like a safety net. If you really work on graph reading skills and you really work on basic recall, what it does is it gives you that safety net to where, let's say you get hit with um, tropospheric ozone formation on an I want to get hit with tropospheric ozone formation. That would be terrifying. Uh, first of all, you know for the it? ozone application but also on the exam getting a one because of that okay. yeah hopefully some people in the comments could chime in and actually tell john what would happen to him if he was just hit with a tropospheric ozone cloud hopefully that that will tell us something about their i think i would turn into a superhero i think it would be <laughs> and then i would have like armor and like lasers for eyes that's what it sounds like but the i'm no. sure we'll get schooled in the comments on what actually just happened to me. Yeah, you would want armor for it. Um, but yeah, back to the kind of writing skills. It's just, it's that safety net, right? You do, let's just say you do get the tropospheric ozone dropped on you in the exam and you're like, I do not know this formula and I know I don't know it. Knowing what you don't know is a skill. And I'm actually trying to teach my students that to write NA on answer prompts that they know they don't know because there's what you know there's, you know, what you don't know, and there's what you don't even know you don't know. And so when you know what you don't know, getting into a lot of no's and don't know's, but when you can identify that is not my point right there, and I can let it go, you've just bought yourself time to go back to that three to four point safety net. So even if you bomb an FRQ, you've stopped the losses at a three or four out of 10, so that your other FRQ, when you get eutrophication, you're like, oh, easy, nitrogen, algae bloom, no oxygen, we're good in and out. And now you got a seven on that FRQ and you're back to that five average. So it's getting yourself that safety net. It's ensuring that the easy points you do not miss. And then you get a couple of the hard points. And that's really, that's really what it is. There's an analogy that uh, my soccer coach always gave me for, for playing in the goal, which can be a little bit tricky because, you know, one of them goes in all of a sudden, your team played a great game, you can lose. But he said, you have to stop all of the shots that you should stop and half of the ones uh, that you shouldn't, or half of the ones that are really hard. And that's FRQ writing. <laughs> you yeah. have to earn all the points that are the easy points. You've got to earn four points on each FRQ. And then you've got to earn a couple that are hard. And if you do that, you have a great shot at a four. And that right there, what you just described, which is something like a little bit of game theory, right? Where instead of trying to be perfect, you try to get the highest score you can. That is the biggest AP exam hack of them all. And I, I remember discovering this in high school when I took AP US history. And in practice, I started getting as high as 82% correct in multiple choice. And I felt like a million bucks because that was well within the five range. The yeah. AP exam is one of the only standardized testing regimes ever invented that will lavish you with a perfect score for around 70% of the points. You yeah. want that nice solid C minus for perfection. You want that good old fashioned D to get a four. You want a nice square F to get a three. It's a weird psychological thing. You take yeah. that practice test and you feel like you're just being attacked by the questions. That's actually how it's built. So yeah. here's what I want to do, um, Jordan. A couple things real quick. One, we, um, we made a post on Instagram the other day about um, America's AP teachers. And we had a few hundred people come in and share and uh, yes. teachers they wanted to shout out. So I have a couple of eights teachers in here that I wanted to highlight. Um, H.A. Scribble, oh, hold on, that got distracted. H.A. Scribble says, Mr. Kozier for AP Sat, Dr. Suter for AP Environmental Science, and Mr. Good for AP Government Macroeconomics. I, and I think wanna... I know Dr. Suter. I, I, if, he, if he's who I'm thinking of, he is from Florida. He's in the national group. And I, I believe he did some of the College Word videos, and I believe he's won uh, 
a, a pretty prestigious award for for science educators. If that's who it's I'm thinking, the famous Dr. Suter. We need to know <laughs> people in the comments. Um, definitely, seriously, follow us on Instagram, guys, and post into this uh, reel your favorite um, AP teachers you want us to shout out. We're going to be doing that throughout this whole series. Um, some great AP environmental teachers are recognized. So Jordan, I'm going to turn it over back, back over to you. We're going to open up uh, unit three here as our next segment. Right. Um, and so let me just really quickly um, make sure that you can share properly. Um, and um, as you are all coming in or watching this video, don't forget to like this video and subscribe to our channel. Also let us know questions that Jordan and I can answer for you as you're getting ready. So Jordan, I'll, I'll turn it back over to you and, uh, and we'll learn some more about unit three. All right, thank you, John. Yeah, we're gonna dive back into populations here. Uh, and so what we wanna do first before we actually get into populations is uh, share my screens so that people know uh, what we're looking at here. Um, so let's actually make that happen here in a second. <laughs> um, but when we talk about populations, as I think I mentioned, uh, we really want to try to think about populations and be able to connect them to biodiversity and to species and their needs. So one thing that we're going to start off with here is 3.1 generalist versus specialist. This is an example of a topic that's pretty simple, but you want to have some of this vocab down. One other thing I want to point out before we move on is just the orientation of the slide and the learning objective that's down in the bottom here. I screenshot these learning objectives directly from the AP Environmental Science course and exam description. It's a 250 page PDF. It's basically the roadmap for teachers on how to teach the course. The nice thing is it's publicly available though. It's on the internet. Um, I can share a link to this later. I'll put it in, in the uh, community section of my YouTube page. You can check it out there. But you can go through this as a student and see exactly what teachers are told by the college board we need to teach you that will be on the exam. So. I really like doing this and I try to make this my learning objective for each of my lessons. I screenshot these and put them in my videos because I really want people to understand that what I'm covering in class, but also in videos, like this is straight from the horse's mouth, so to speak. This is right from the college board. We know what we need to know about populations. And this is one thing we need to be familiar with, generalists versus specialists. So different organisms have different needs. And here's a great example that I love, the panda and the raccoon. Relatively simil similar organisms evolutionarily, not all that separate, but very distinct in terms of where you'll find them. Raccoons are a generalist and it's just like what it sounds like. They can be found in ecosystems all over the world. They have a really broad niche. So they're able to utilize tons of food sources and they're just very, you know, prolific. They breed rapidly. They live all over the place. And it's why you see them in the city or running across the road, you know, when you're biking into school in the morning, if your name's teacher like me. Uh, the panda, on the other hand, is a specialist. It has a very narrow range of uh, tolerance. It has very specific habitat needs. And so you're not going to find it everywhere. And so understanding the differences between these two is important. But we'll talk about shortly understanding what that means for these populations when it comes to extinction, when it comes to being invasive, when it comes to biodiversity. The big thing we want to do in apes is think interconnectedness. How does whether or not something is a generalist or specialist impact whether or not it is likely to go extinct, whether or not it's likely to become invasive, how it will impact its community. It's the circle of life, right? It's all interconnected. It's like they say in the Lion King. So uh, here we go. 3.2 now is case selected and R selected species. This is also a fun topic because we get to talk about reproductive strategies and they're just that, they are strategies. So case selected species are gonna mature very slowly. They're gonna be organisms like us, humans are case selected, chimpanzees are case selected, you know, most mammals are case selected. And it's a strategy because we invest a ton of energy in taking care of offspring. What that means is we have only a couple at a time K-selected species take a long time to mature. Uh, they're not going to have a lot of uh, young all at once. They're going to have a few and they're going to take really good care of them, ensure that they survive, ensure that they grow up and reach adulthood. But this means that they're going to have slower population growth. They're not going to have explosive population growth. And their name K comes from the fact that they are found more likely at their population's carrying capacity. And so if you look at this graph here, 
This is carrying capacity in the dotted line. And so case selected species are not gonna have this rapid, rapid growth. They're gonna grow slowly. They're gonna stabilize over time. And they're also gonna be vulnerable to population crashes and extinction. If it takes them many years to reach sexual maturity and many years to have offspring and raise them and take care of them, they're just not gonna be able to recover. They're not gonna be able to bounce back if their ecosystem is disturbed. And so when we think about what are the most prominent endangered species, you know, we have things like the rhino, or we have, you know, things like the bald eagle at one point. We have, you know, a lot of marine mammals are, are threatened or, or near extinction. Um, a lot of uh, primates as well are, are just having their habitats dwindle and they're prone to extinction. If we look at our selected species, oysters, mussels, frogs, fish, you know, things that have tons and tons of offspring and mature really rapidly and reproduce really rapidly, they're going to grow rapidly. Their population growth is going to be explosive and they're not going to be as vulnerable to population change. They're not going to be going extinct um, nearly as easily because they can recover when their populations crash. What that means is they are more likely to be invasive. So an oyster or a zebra mussel is a great example. They can come into an ecosystem, produce millions of eggs at once, and they quickly take over the ecosystem and crowd out case selected. So now all of a sudden we have our selected and case, selected. but they're not just sets of characteristics that we memorize, they are interactions. So the R selected species are more likely to drive case selected species out of their habitat or outcompete them for resources because they breed so rapidly. So back to uh, generalists and specialists, we could probably come up with uh, whether or not generalists are more likely to be R or case selected and whether or not specialists are more likely to be R or case selected. That doesn't hold true all the time, but it does relate to how likely organisms are to go extinct or to become invasive and drive other organisms out of their habitats. All right, here is 3.3 survivorship curves. So here we have to understand how long organisms survive. We have to understand age cohorts. Um, so what this means is that type one survivorship, these are case selected large mammals, they're gonna have high survivorship early in, in life. So look at humans, uh, look at elephants, rhinoceroses, uh, tigers, lions, they're going to take really good care of their young. Think about a mother grizzly bear. It's going to take a lot to separate her from a cub. And so they're going to survive. They're going to ensure that their offspring survive. So if we look at this graph and we see on the y-axis, we have survivorship, very high survivorship early in life. Then when we look at type two, these are going to be birds, rodents, things that have relatively consistent population decline throughout their life, um, they might provide a little parental care, but they're more likely to be preyed on due to their small size. So they're not going to survive terribly long. Uh, they're going to crash and kind of consistently decline throughout life. Then we have type three. These are our selected species. They just kind of, for lack of a better term, are churning out offspring very rapidly. So trees, insects, fish, and they have really high infant mortality. Think about a tree seedling. How many tree seedlings that get dropped by a giant maple uh, land in the right soil, get the right amount of sunlight, water, and become an adult tree. Very, very few, very, very uh, high likelihood that they don't survive. Same thing with baby sea turtles. Uh, same thing with, you know, insects. Many of them are not going to survive their first couple hours of life. And so that's type three survivorship. So we can see here, these three topics are all interconnected. Because of what we know about KNR selected species, we can kind of remember how they're likely to survive on a survivorship curve and what it means for their interactions with each other. Okay, now we're gonna to combine topics 3.4 and 3.5, which are carrying capacity and resource availability or how resources impact populations. So I mentioned this term carrying capacity earlier. Carrying capacity is what it sounds like. It's how many organisms can live in a certain ecosystem based on resource availability. So on the left of this uh, image here, we have this green graph, which is going to show us just like a theoretical idea here uh, that a population is going to be exponentially growing early on when there's really no constraints on the population. But then the growth begins to slow. This could be when organisms start out competing each other. So maybe deer or elk are fighting each other for mates or for nesting sites or for food. And then eventually growth gets close to zero because there isn't enough food to go around. There aren't enough mates to go around. The population can't grow anymore. 
Um, and that's nice and dandy in a textbook. And so this image is taken right out of a textbook. Uh, it's cool to help us understand, but it's not what really happens. What really happens with carrying capacity is overshoot and die off. Um, there's a really fun game that my students and I play that we couldn't play this year due to COVID, but basically it's like a big game of Red Rover where deer have to look for a resource. And when they find a resource, they can survive to the next game, but when they don't, they die. And what it emphasizes is that when certain deer die, they go and become resources. Now there's a bunch more resources so we can have more deer. And it just oscillates back and forth. And so what does this look like in the wild? Well, large mammals like elk or deer or moose, they're gonna typically breed in the fall, but they're not gonna have their calves or their young until the spring. So that means all of a sudden you have a huge uh, explosion of population because you have all of these young being born and there's not gonna be enough food for them. And so they're gonna die off. They're gonna go back below carrying capacity. But then the next year, there is enough food now because of the population crash that happened the last year. And the same thing repeats itself. And so in reality, populations of deer in the forest don't just go static at this kind of perfect carrying capacity. They shoot up over the carrying capacity and then they rapidly die off go up and over and die off. And so what we need to understand here is the impact of carrying capacity on ecosystems. So as these deer overshoot and die off, they're also going to be affecting foliage. They're going to be eating a lot of plants, trees, they're going to be browsing them. So other organisms might lose their food source. Another thing we have to think about is their predator. So look at these oscillations in deer, elk, or moose population. What do you think is going to happen to a wolf population if they're there? Well, they may have overshoot of their carrying capacity too when the elf, uh, the elf, hopefully there's no elves, um, but the elk overshoot theirs and then die back and now the wolf population dies back. So what we have is again, a very dynamic, very changing, very fluid ecosystem when it comes to population size. We need to know that resources limit population sizes, predators can limit population size, even disease. If the herd gets really dense, some of them might die off due to disease spread. So we just covered uh, four, you know, five topics here in unit three. And what I want you to do is if you have some time, you're watching this replay, uh, we probably won't stop on the live and spend a lot of time on this. Um, but we have a practice question where you could actually try using the FRQ task verb and what we have just learned to identify a characteristic of K strategist, K selected species, and explain how does that characteristic you identified make them prone to extinction. So again, we're gonna keep things moving here because I have some really good resources I wanna share with you guys. I don't wanna run out of time for that. Uh, and many of you are gonna watch this on a replay. So you can pause the video if you're on a replay, try this right now. If you're live with us though, uh, follow along here and check out our answer key. So this is straight from the college board. And this kind of goes back to what John was mentioning earlier about like, how do I elevate my writing? How do I make sure that I'm actually earning points for these? Like I know things about R and K strategists. When I get the multiple choice questions, I'm golden, but then I have to write about it and it falls apart. So let's take a look at the scoring guide here. What does it actually look like? So this was an identify and explain. So it was actually a two point question. So on this question, if you're looking at this and you're thinking, I'm not sure how to explain the characteristic you'd still want to at least try this question and identify what is a characteristic of a case strategist that makes them prone to extinction. If you didn't think you could explain it, it's still worth trying to identify. Um, so you could say things such as few offspring, um, they're going to have a really low reproductive rate. So they're not going to be, you know, birthing very often or having a ton of offspring. Um, they're also going to provide really high parental care. So they have protection of offspring, a long gestation period. That's a fancy word for they carry their young for a long time. Um, or a late age for first reproduction. Then if we look at the explanation, what we need to do is connect this characteristic to the explanation of how that makes them prone to extinction. So let's go back to the prompt one more time. This is a great example of how explain is cause and effect. It's step-by-step, step, it's connecting the dots. And you wanna circle back to the prompt in your answer. So I have a lot of students that identify a characteristic of case selected and they might say case selected species have few offspring. Then instead of explaining specifically how that characteristic makes those organisms prone to extinction, they might say like they only have 
two to three per year and they take really good care of them. Whereas our selected species have a bunch and don't take care of them. That's all right, but that's a good answer to a different question. It doesn't connect in a step-by-step -step manner the characteristic of the case selected species to why it will go extinct, why it's prone to extinction. And you have to get out of the mindset of writing the first thing that comes in your head or what you think is an important fact and ask yourself, am I writing to the prompt? Is my answer of the characteristic of the case selected species, is it connecting to why elephants are prone to extinction? So if we go back here, let's look at some answers. If you have few offspring as an elephant, it's difficult to recover from population decline. So your population declines, you may not be able to recover, it may decline further and you go extinct. Uh, you may be un unable to adapt to changing environments, again, due to slow population recovery. And so you have to be explicit about connecting the two. And that's one of the biggest pieces of advice I can give you. When it comes to go-to FRQ answers, we're going to cover some go-to FRQ answers, and then I'm going to make sure that you leave with some resources here. So on go-to FRQ answers here for Unit 3, you want to be careful when you talk about extinction. This prompt asks specifically about extinction. But many times I've seen students say, if humans cut down a forest, a, a lot of species will go extinct. And that's not really accurate. It's not accurate to say that if we cut down one forest, we've just caused extinction of a species. That means they're gone from the planet. So the phrase population decline, I want you to try to commit that to memory. That's a really important apes phrase to have down. It's a go-to answer. So let's say humans go through and do, you know, deforestation of an area for urbanization or for agriculture. It could cause population decline of birds. It could cause population decline of trees. That could then cause biodiversity loss due to smaller populations, less genetic size. So now we're connecting unit three population to biodiversity loss unit two. So think about the interconnectedness. Think about how the units relate to each other. Then if we have population decline, now all of a sudden the species is vulnerable to extinction. They might not bounce back. They might have inbreeding depression. That means when they breed with closely related organisms, they might have uh, young that are more likely to die. Um, it can destabilize the food web. So if you have a huge crash of one species of bird, it doesn't just affect that species of bird. It affects the bigger birds that ate them. It affects the smaller insects that they ate. It affects the seeds that they disperse. And this is thinking like a mountain. So if you watch my channel much, you're familiar with the terminology. You've got to think like a mountain. What does it mean for one population of organisms to decline? It means a lot of things. And so all of a sudden, if you can make these connections from this central hub of population decline, you have a go-to answer in your pocket here. If you can get to population decline, you can get to vulnerability to extinction, biodiversity loss, destabilized food webs. You have all of these great details that you can unpack. Let's look at how we can connect this to biodiversity. Biodiversity is maybe, it's hard to rank all of the apes topics. Climate change is probably number one. Biodiversity is right up there. <laughs> it is a critical apes topic. You want to be able to write about it on an FRQ. So let's talk about how can we work in biodiversity in the answers. Well, oftentimes you'll be asked for consequences of a human activity. So deforestation, fossil fuel combustion, climate change, urbanization, agriculture, all of those human activities decrease biodiversity, but we don't wanna just leave it at that. How do they do that? Will they remove habitats that organisms need to survive and reproduce? Now we're there, we've brought the point home. We haven't stranded it by just going, Oh, deforestation equals biodiversity loss. We need to actually walk our reader through and make that connection. We've removed a habitat. Now there's population decline. All of a sudden we're back to talking about population decline. So you can really integrate these ideas together, biodiversity and population decline. How can we recover biodiversity? Though? How can we bring it back? We can replant forests. Uh, we can have urban gardens and parks, conserve land. Sustainable agriculture, so trying to take up less land and preserve the soil quality, maybe even plant, you know, buffer strips around our crops so that we have some contiguous habitat spaces that surround the farm ecosystem. All of those things protect and increase biodiversity by establishing natural habitats that organisms need to survive and reproduce. 
So we've gone through go-to biodiversity answers. We've gone through go-to population decline answers. And if you can get to these ideas on an FRQ, you stand a really good chance of earning that point and bringing it home. So in our last segment here, uh, we're gonna go through some resources that I want you to leave with. So I'm gonna have John share some of these links out and then we're gonna go through how you can actually use these. And I think we're gonna be getting out right on schedule with you leaving with some really awesome review resources here. Great, and Jordan, I just want to, um, we switch here. Yeah, make sure that everyone, um, these are great links and I'll actually, uh, while you're sharing these resources, I'm gonna be putting these in the chat and then I'll put them in the video Perfect. description later. Um, yep. For, let me just see real quick. Um, <laughs> Leo is maybe the best comment of the whole group. I have no idea why I'm here. I don't even have this class, um, but hey, you're having fun with us. Um, Thanks so for it is, it is great um, to see you guys um, all here. Let us know what questions you have. Jordan uh, and I can answer them for you. I'm gonna post these links in the chat and let you wrap up, Jordan. Thanks. All right, awesome. Yeah, so a couple of resources here that John's gonna share out. One of them uh, is a link to all nine units of Ape Slides. Uh, and so this is every single slide that's in my videos. If you want to just have them for your purposes for reviewing, all of them are here. Um, when it comes to unit eight, um, I believe I have five or six more topics, so I'm almost done. But other than that, the course is complete. So, I mean, you can open up, we'll just um, open up, uh, well, not unit three, that's a boring one. Um, <laughs> we'll open up unit nine, which is atmospheric. Uh, we're going to start off with, with ozone depletion here, but this is an important unit, climate change. So you can just see that um, exactly what I use in the background of my videos, you have access to here. And so... It's gonna load slow because we're on Zoom, but you get the picture. Um, all of the content that you need to cover is available here for you in slide form. Um, I share these out with a lot of people and I just get really great feedback that they've been helpful. And so I wanted everybody to have them. So I don't want you to have to rely on the video, pausing it to take screenshots or anything like that. I want you to have access to this and you know be able to see these things here. Yes, yeah, so I'm going to uh, make sure we can share this out here. Uh, and so let me grab that link um, and we'll just get the share link here and then John will make sure this gets into the chat. Um, so again, really recommend going through these uh, for just a basic way to cover content. Um, so this is gonna give you all of the basic nuts and bolts as I like to say for the course um, that you need. Uh, obviously there are other great resources to expand upon. Um, it's, you know, far from, from everything that's covered, but it really is the bare essentials. And so I highly recommend checking those out. The next thing I want to do is the targeted review guide. So I have last year's versions here and this year's versions here. And so these are questions that will prompt you to think about the most important points for each topic. And so I highly recommend going through these targeted reviews and doing something called retrieval practice. I'm gonna share this link uh, with John as well. Um, but what retrieval practice is, is uh, the best strategy that you're not yet using. <laughs> That's actually how it was introduced to me. I heard a teacher who I really respect sharing that. Um, so let me talk about it for just a second here as we wrap up. So retrieval practice is without a prompt. So without a multiple choice idea in front of you. you know, multiple choice can still serve as retrieval practice, but it's more powerful when you are taking away your resources and trying to pull from your memory a concept or an idea. And it's even more powerful when you try to write it out or articulate it in long form. And so we have actually some data here and I'll spare you all the details, but this was a very large study done um, with middle school social studies students. They were studying Egypt and they were studying Mesopotamia. And we have the proportion of the material covered in class that they were able to recall with no prompts, uh, simply with just open-ended test questions when they use each of these study methods. So when they studied it once, recalled very, very little, when they just briefly glanced through it. When they recalled it once, meaning they were given no prompts but forced to try to rewrite what they knew, uh, they got up to 30%. When they did repeated mask, which is basically think of it as just flipping through flashcards over and over again a couple times, uh, up to 30%. But when they did repeated spaced review, 
So meaning they tried to retrieve the information when they did it over and over again, spread out, we got up into the 80s. And so this is a much better way to try to recall information. So what does retrieval practice look like in apes? Well, go follow the apes versus everybody Instagram account. And then each day, what I do is post a daily topic uh, of each um, one of the 99 topics in the course. And what I encourage you to do is to give yourself what's called a brain dump quiz. So a brain dump quiz is where you look at a topic. So I might say, you know, topic 3.1, generalists and specialists. And on a piece of paper or in a document, I type up everything I can remember about specialists and generalists. I set a five minute timer or a three minute timer and I just go as long as I can. I try to recall every single thing I can. Then what you can do is flip through the slides and see how much you recalled and see if you recalled it accurately. So I might think of eutrophication, you know, topic 8.5. And I'm going to write down, okay, eutrophication. Um, okay, it's nutrients. It's too much nitrogen. Algae blooms. Fish die. Uh, it can be really bad for biodiversity. I would write that down. Then I would actually flip through the 8.5 slides that were posted to the Apes versus Everybody page. And I go, oh, I missed that it's specifically nitrate and phosphate. Um, that those are two of the compounds that can lead to this. Oh, I missed that it could be from agriculture and it could also be from sewage. And so you're going to see what did I remember and what did I not remember? And it really shows you where are the holes in your knowledge. Um, and then finally, again, just a little bit more of a reminder here of what retrieval practice actually is. Again, it's self-quizzing from memory. That's super important. Um, studies show that simply scanning your notes, going through them, or scanning through these slides that I've created, or just watching a video. Passive stuff like that does not make information stay in your mind as well as retrieval practice, as well as self-quizzing yourself, forcing yourself to recall it. We don't like doing it because it's harder. Students complain about FRQs. Um, students complain about pop quizzes with no prompts. Um, but that's how we remember things. There's really strong science to show that the neurons in your brain are actually strengthened. The axons and the myelin sheath around them gets thicker. The information transmits faster when you forcefully recall from memory. It's very active. It's hard. We get a little bit uncomfortable when we do it, but I highly recommend this. So you can do things like rewrite the main idea from your notes. So let's say you watched a video and took notes, give it a 30 minute break, come back, get a blank sheet of paper and write everything you could remember then check to see how well you remembered things. Um, after the you know, questions that are at the end of the video, there's an, an FRQ at the end of each video that I create in each slide, try writing the FRQ. I have scoring guides that are coming out to them uh, soon and those will be shared on the community page as well so you can actually check yourself. Um, answer the targeted review questions that were shared earlier and just see then how did I do when I use my notes. Um, so all of these things are really important resources to use and also just an important strategy you can use in all aspects of school. Again, I was really amazed when I read this book, Make, uh, uh, Make It Stick, and basically the science of learning. And I was amazed at how ineffective it is to just flip through your notes and reread them or even reread your textbook. It's very passive. It doesn't stay in your brain the same way as when you force yourself to recall. it. So there's maybe the biggest tip of the night when it comes to uh, studying really across the board. So I hope that was helpful. I hope you guys leave feeling like you have some apes, apes exam hacks. Um, just make sure that you know that Marco has all of these other awesome supports for you. Check out the stuff they're doing. Um, there's a lot going on there. And we have, of course, the other social medias as well. TikTok coming soon. John has convinced me uh, it's, too, it's too happening of a place not to be there. That is right. It is. Um, to happening of a place for you not to be putting out some AP environmental science gold. A couple things real quick, Jordan, if you could just resend me that first link, it actually took just a chapter nine and I'll, I'll update that both in the chat and the description. Yeah. For everyone who's joined us tonight, thank you so much. I hope that this has been helpful. If it has, like this video, subscribe, and definitely be in touch with us both at Marco Learning on Apes versus Everybody. We're gonna give you on the Marco Learning account, you get a lot of that general information about the digital guides, about how to do well in the exams, and then obviously there's just a wealth of content and information. My myelin sheaths were expanding um, through this whole lesson. Um, so you know, I'm glad that you found this helpful. Everyone who's joined us, thank you guys. Um, and like I said, we'll post this 
uh, link. I'm going to put this back into the chat for all of you. Um, one of the questions we're getting, a few people have asked, AG says, hey, Mr. Smeeds, where can we find the answers to your FRQs in your video? Mm, um, also, question. I want to ask you, can you put the answer for the FRQ you use on the videos? Tell us a little bit about that. The answer for the FRQ that we just use now or in each of my videos on my channel? Yeah, I'm not sure where, where do I, do I just Google the answers if I'm studying from your videos? Yeah, so great, great question. Um, certainly you can self check yourself, like to see if the basic factual information was correct, but the value in scoring guides is that they tell you what the college board actually said you needed to know. So here is the limitation to some of the answers at the, or some of the questions at the end of my videos, some are taken directly from the college board because they're publicly available, but some I wrote myself. Um, and so I still create scoring guides for a lot of those. And I'm in the process of going back and creating them for every unit right now. I think I have them for unit four, five, and six. Um, but those are going to be on the community page of my uh, YouTube channel. Also make sure they're shared on our Instagram, but yeah, I'm in the process of as soon as my unit eight notes are done, having an AP style FRQ rubric for every single review question there. Uh, I'll post the ones that I already have, make sure they're available there on both uh, Instagram, both the community page of my, YouTube channel as well. So you want to go check that out. Um, but yeah, th those are the ways that you would check kind of the best way to know for sure. Um, but I will have study uh, or answer guides coming out to the ones that I wrote myself. Great. So again, this is his channel. I've linked to this in the description and in the chat. When he says community page, this is what he means. This is one place to go. And you, the other thing you can do is follow him right on Instagram uh, here as well. You're going to see tons of great content for each of these topics. So thank you so much for joining. Uh, Jordan, thank you everyone who's come along. Let us know in the chat, in the comments, how we can help you. And otherwise, have a great night, everyone. Stay safe and best of luck on your AP Environmental Science exam.